Are you ready to worship Cornerstone? Let's stand. Let's just invite the Lord in the room and the place today. Heavenly Father, God, we raise our hands to you. We lift our hands towards heaven, Lord God. And we don't come in a hurry, Father God, because we just want you. And Lord God, so we just slow our lives down for this morning, Father God. We slow our minds down, Lord God. And we just come here to just wait for you, Father God. Come, Holy Spirit, pour out your spirit on all flesh here today, Lord God. And Father God, we just praise you, Lord God, that your kingdom would come your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven father god in jesus name that the atmosphere is shifting as we praise and we pray and we declare your word father god that your word is going forth today father god and lord god that you're changing situations you're turning things around you're the god of the breakthrough you're the god of the turnaround father god and you're just working things together for good. And so we speak life here today over every situation and circumstance. Father God, that there's healing where there's brokenness. And Father God, that there's freedom where there was bondage. And the chains are being broken in the house today. And Father God, that you're coming to save, heal, sanctify, and deliver, Father God. We come to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we will not be denied. We receive everything that you have, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you daily love us with benefits. Blessed to be the Lord, oh my soul. Ooh. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Do you receive it today, Cornerstone? Are you ready to worship? I'm not convinced yet. Are you ready to worship? we're almost there. The front is open, by the way. The aisles are open. Don't forget where you are. You're in a place where you are free to worship in spirit and in truth. You're not being restrained by anyone today. Follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the scriptures. And we'll leave the rest of the Lord. Let's go. Ready, Caleb? One, two, three, four.
blood is one and children of generations of every nation of kingdom come love to hear your voices don't let your heart be troubled and hold your head up I don't feel no evil and fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where I
Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, is kingdom come. went out when death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on the cross he made for sin blood atoned one final breath then it was finished but not the end we could have known
to be with you all this morning. Today we're going to be talking about healing from hurt. And I just believe the Lord has something really special in store for us today. I know Pastor Larry has something as well and just what's going to happen at the altar today. Man, just watch out. Just watch out. It's according to your faith. It's according to your faith. You get what you expect. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time and just ask him to guide us as we get into the word. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, that you know how to make the word come to life. As you walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, their hearts burned within them. They got holy heartburn as you taught them the word of God. (laughs) And so, Lord God, we pray that your word would come forth today like a flame and a fire. God, that we would just get out of your way. Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and and be the teacher, be the God. Give us eyes to see what Jesus needs us to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying to the church and God in hearts to live it out and obey it. Lord, we just come running towards you with everything we've got. We love you, we thank you, and we honor you, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. amen, amen. This past week... I heard about a a gentleman, he looked over at his daughter and he asked her, he said, hey, could you go get me a a phone book? And and she just started laughing at him and started making fun of him about how old he was. She even called him an old dinosaur. Can you believe that? And she said, you need to learn how to use one of these things. And she handed him her brand new iPhone. And the guy said, well, long story short, he said, the iPhone is now broken but that big spider's dead. <laughs> Praise God. Today we're talking about healing from hurt. Healing from hurt. Each one of us knows what it's like to be hurt in some ways. Some of you are a little more accident prone maybe than others. I don't know. And you've been hurt a little bit more than the rest of us. And, of course, there's physical hurt, but there's also emotional damage. And it just reminded me of years ago, I I was just a kid, maybe 12 years old, and we went on a a long uh, bike trip on the C&O Canal Trail. It's kind of over towards Maryland. And it was an overnight trip. We biked like 50 miles or so in a couple days. And uh, on the first day there, we stopped at a Civil War battlefield called Antietam. One of the greatest battles in the Civil War. Thousands and thousands of, of, of men died there that day. And, and just an amazing place. And it sits way up on a high hill. And so we bike up to the top, and we're walking around, and we're looking at everything. Well, before I went on the trip, I had wrecked my bike. And I had bent in the front posts that hold the front tire. And so we took it to a shop, and they bent it back out the best we, that they could. And it seemed to be fine. But see, it hadn't been tested to its full extent. Because see, you got to get to full speed. And the only place I think in the world you can get to full speed is at Antietam. Because there's this big, huge, long hill that just goes and goes and goes. And, you know, it's, you remember this as a kid. You know, it gets going so fast you just lift up your feet because you can't keep up with the spokes anymore. And, I mean, it, it got up to that point, and then it just keeps going because this hill just goes and goes, and it's steep, and it's long, and we are flying down through there, and it, it, it's just so much fun. And all of a sudden, because those, those front posts were just slightly not quite right, that bike just started to shake violently. And, I mean, all of a sudden, it was, I mean, I'm going, I don't know how fast, as fast as a bicycle can go. And all of a sudden, that thing is shaking like mad, and I'm thinking, yeah, this ship's going down. (laughs) 
And I smacked down on that black top, you know, and I mean, just skidding down the road. <laughs> on my knees. I mean, they're scraping across. It hurt. And, you know, I still to this day have, if I pay attention, there's, there's scars on, on the front of both of my kneecaps. You know, but thank God it doesn't really hurt anymore. There's scars. There's evidence that it happened. But there's no pain because I'm healed. And see, hmm, come on. That's how God wants to move in our life. You're going to get scars. You're going to go through pain. But the thing he wants is for you to be able to get up and eventually, I never noticed those scars. I hadn't even thought about them in years. I don't even notice them. It doesn't hurt at all. I've went on with my life. My life is, is and it just reminds me, speaking of, of feeling old, do y'all remember, at least most of you remember the old, you had to go rent a movie at a store? Remember this saying you want to watch a movie, so you're either going to the theater or you have to drive to the store where the movies are. And, and a lot of you remember going there to get uh, Blu-rays and DVDs. But I remember going there to get tapes. I'm old and I'm proud of it. VHS tapes, and on these tapes, you all remember this, it said on it, almost all of them said, be kind, please, rewind. <laughs> and a lot of these stores, if you showed up without your tape rewound, you were going to were gonna get an extra fee. And I think we as people, we act like an old VHS tape. We get to, to something in our life and we just keep rewinding and we live it over and over again. And I wish we would just do this over the good stuff, but actually we have a tendency to drag up old wounds. And, and what we need to do is this, turn to your neighbor and say, be kind, please don't rewind. <laughs> <laughs> we need to stop rewinding. See, to live in the victory and freedom that God has for you, you have to learn to forget things and move on. You have to learn, listen, to let it go. It has to become a skill in our life. If you don't, this is what happens. You always, where there should be a scar, you're still bleeding on the inside. And here's the worst part, is what happened to you is over. But what happens then is that because you're bleeding on the inside, you're going to bump into a brother or sister, and you're going to bleed on them. They didn't do it to you. They didn't say that thing to you. They weren't the ones that betrayed you. They weren't the ones that let you down. They weren't even the ones that hurt you. And so often it's, it's the people that we're closest to and we're bleeding on them out of our pain, out of our unhealed wounds that we haven't moved on from and we blow up on people and we tear them down and we won't let them into our hearts because of things that have happened to us. But the Bible says in Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Jesus will heal you from the inside out. See, they may have hurt you once, but don't let them hurt you the rest of your life. It may have hurt then. You don't have to hurt forever. You can be free this morning. Because, listen, we're all going to get hurt. And some of you have probably been hurt more than some others here. But we've all been hurt, and we will be. Matthew 18, 7, Jesus said, Woe to the world because of offenses. These offenses are hurts, and they're also temptations. 
They are temptations for us to step into sin, to step into hurt and bitterness, and to hold on to those things. He says, for offenses, look, they must come. We are in a fallen world. How many of y'all know that this world, since the fall in the garden, there has been sin, which has resulted in death and pain and things that God never willed for us to have? He says, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. How many of you know that ultimately everyone's going to answer to their creator? That no one gets away with anything ultimately. And so this is what Jesus said in the last days. This is a last days message for the church. See, we talk about how Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars, and we see that that there will be famines and pestilences, that there will be earthquakes in various places. And we see all these things going on. But he went on to say in verse 12, in Matthew 24, that there will be many who would be offended. How many of y'all have noticed that, especially on the far left, they've almost made being offended a virtue? Well, that offends me. And it's just all this constant... Like this self-righteous attitude they have. They're more religious than anybody that goes to church. But the religion is completely unbiblical. But here's the thing. How many of y'all know that them, people being offended all the time, you don't have to admit it, but it gets under your skin. Right? It... it, it and it just makes life wearisome. And, and he went on to say in verse 14, he said, and because iniquity will abound, it'll be everywhere. Sin will be rampant. He said, the love of many is going to grow cold. And the church, above all else, is to be the living, walking love of God on this planet. Jesus said, how else will the world know you? How are they going to know you? Because of your love for one another. And so we, listen, if, if the coldness of the world has put our fire of love out, God is coming in this morning near the brokenhearted, and he's saying, you know what? Iniquity may abound. Offense is coming. It's actually getting worse. But listen to what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He says, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. That's an inward confidence an inward peace, he's talking about, an inward quiet. He says, in this world, you will have what? Tribulation. That is speaking of pressure and stress and trouble, but, but, see, what I'm not going to do this morning is preach the gospel that if you're a Christian, everything will be fine. What I'm going to tell you is that this world is messed up. And it's not actually getting better. The Bible says that evil men will wax worse and worse. I'm telling you, this world is messed up, but that's why Jesus came. And he says, I have overcome the world. The world brought its worst at Jesus, and Jesus has overcome it all. That means every offense, every trial, every worry, every stressful situation, Jesus has conquered it for you. You have the victory in him this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, praise God, we have the victory. Oh. This world is diseased and we have the cure. This world has troubles and we have the answer. This world has confusion and we have the direction. Come on, church. See, what the enemy wants us to do in these last days is grumble and complain and murmur. And that's what Israel did in the wilderness. In the book of Numbers, they complained, they murmured about Moses. And I don't even know Moses was a type of Christ. And, and God said, enough of that. And, and fiery serpents began to go through the camp. They were poisonous, began to bite the people. They were dying. And, of course, they come to the guy they've been complaining about. Moses, we can't stand you, but should you please pray for us? <laughs> and 
And Moses, man, if you want to know how to have a shepherd's heart, it's a good place to turn. And he intercedes for them. And God says, I want you to take bronze and I want you to mold a staff with a, with a snake on top of it. And when the people look up, they'll be healed. And Jesus, are you all hearing me? Jesus said, we all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But do you know John, 4, John 3, 14? Just back up two verses and Jesus had said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. He was talking about the cross. How is it that a serpent could represent Jesus? Because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made him on that cross to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. This morning we've all been bitten by the snake at some point. And his desire is for us to go with the rest of our life bleeding and defeated. He's, he's wanting to drag us down into depression. He's wanting to drag us into unbelief. He's wanting to drag us out of church, out of fellowship. He's wanting to plant seeds of bitterness, fear, grief, anxiety into our life. But Jesus was lifted up on that cross. And we can take our fear, our bitterness, our anxieties, our sins, our failures, our defeats, the stress of this world, the stress of the political world, everything that's going on. And we look to him and we know that he's overcome it all. Jesus is the cure to every anxiety, every fear, and every heartbreak. Jesus faced it all. You know, when they were trying to make anti-venom for steak bites, the first place they tried was horses because everybody has known for thousands of years that horses have great resistance to snake bites. They have the antibodies. But when they made anti-venom from, from the horses, they found that a lot of times it didn't work fast enough for humans. And so they went on a search, and they went through different animals. But what they found, and I'm not making this up, what they found was the most potent resistance to antibodies they found was through the blood of a lamb. And so when John the Baptist sees Jesus walking up to the water, how does he announce him? Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We have the antibodies. You've been bitten, but you've got the antibodies. Just listen. Oh, don't be injected with the things of the world. Get injected with the blood of Jesus. Who? Oh, let him set you free from burden and anxiety this morning, from things people have done to you. They may have hurt you back then, but you don't have to be hurt now. They may have controlled you then, but don't let it control you now. It's time we learn to move on. And so this morning, listen, the Bible tells us the way we get saved is we have to recognize and confess. We have to recognize that Jesus is Lord. We surrender our life to him in repentance and we confess. The Bible says if we believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we shall be saved. And so, Lord, listen, the word of confession means this, to agree with God and say the same thing. And so the first step to healing is this, is to recognize your hurt. It's to recognize your hurt. And when I say this, everybody's flesh here this morning wants me to stop. There's a reason we don't recognize hurt. It hurts. Everybody in here has the ability to compartmentalize. And what that is, is you take the betrayal, you take the hurt, you, you take the letdown, you take the failure, and, and you put it in that little box. And you're like, we don't go there. We don't talk about that. And if you ever do, it's like the slurry of bad emotions just comes running out, doesn't it? Poof, out comes all that, all that stuff. And how many of y'all know your, your memory has no timeline? Have you ever noticed that stuff that happened years ago, if you start thinking about it, it's, it feels like it just happened today. 
And so when I'm talking about this, I'm not saying recognize your hurt to me. I mean, we can talk about it, but I'm saying take it to the one that's near the brokenhearted. Have a little talk with Jesus, like the old song used to say. Let's go on in the Bible here. This is good. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139. See, a lot of us, we have canned away that stuff so long, we even part of we even think we're we're beyond it. But it's still there. And so he says in Psalm 139, verse 23, search me. It's it's saying, God, I want you to come like a big light. And get down inside of my heart. And every door in my heart is wide open. I want, you to, I want you to take a look, God. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me. The word means test me. And know my anxieties. Why does he say anxieties? Because the Bible says, fret not. It only leads to wrongdoing. So much of what we walk out in life that is out of faith is because we're operating in fear and anxiety. The word anxieties is talking about fearful thought patterns. Nobody here has any of those, right? Nobody here ever else has any negative thought patterns, right? That thought of, oh, I'm not going to go there because I remember what happened the last time. But he says, search me, God. I want, you to, I want you to bring that stuff up because I don't want to be in bondage anymore. See if, the, if there's any wicked way in me. And that word way means the way I'm walking out my life. But instead, lead me in what? The way everlasting. I want everything in my life to be pointed heaven bound. I want everything in my life to be oriented with the abundant life that Jesus died for me to have. And God, if there's any stuff, even just the way I'm thinking, that's out of alignment with you, I want you to bring it into a straight line. Come on, church. Come on, church. It's a narrow gate, and it's a straight road that leads to the kingdom. And so he's bringing the church in alignment. He says, I know that these last days, there's lots of people offended and there's a lot to offend you. There's a lot to be offended by. The world is hateful. The world is difficult. But I have a narrow road where you're going to walk in freedom from this stuff. You're not going to be like the rest of the world, church. You're not going to be in bondage. You're going to recognize this stuff. He says in Hebrews 12, 15, remember we're recognizing this. He says, looking how carefully turn to your neighbor and say we better look carefully we better look carefully do you know what churches are doing churches are much better at just keeping people busy it's like we got to have another dinner and then we got to have this event we got to run to this and we just keep ourselves busy so that we don't have to deal with this stuff And then we wonder why when we, when we said something to sister and so-and-so, she blew up on us. Why we did that to brother so-and-so, he gave us the cold shoulder. They're carrying all this hurt and all this inward pain around, and they just bled on you a little bit. Because the church, listen, instead of doing all this stuff, why don't we stop and just be his sons and daughters? He doesn't call us human doings. We're beings. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Man, is your life, have you availed yourself of everything that God wants for you? Are you truly walking in the fullness of freedom? Because he says when you fall short of the grace of God, it means this. All the freedom, all the joy, all the victory that the grace of God has provided for you when Jesus said, I have overcome the world, or are you walking in defeat and things that aren't the God's best for you? He, say, he goes on to say, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. The word root means a source, and bitterness means a resentful spirit, a hurt spirit. And this is the worst part about it. And by this, many become defiled. (laughs) 
See, bitterness is like drinking poison. And you think it's hurting the other guy. And the worst part is, I'm going to say it, when you drink poison, you become poisonous. And that's why many other people get defiled too. You ever met a family and it just seems like they're all bitter? They just all have this, ah, about them. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you're in that family. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm not picking on anybody. Man, we're like famous in West Virginia for holding grudges. You know what I mean? You talk to somebody about West Virginia, like they think mountains and then Hatfields and McCoys, you know? Man. <sighs> Look carefully. Lord, I want you to pull up the bitter roots. How many of y'all know that we need to let the Holy Ghost weed the garden of our lives so that the good fruit can grow again? Come on, church. Come on. <laughs> Peter, Peter thought he had this thing down. He said, all right, Jesus. He knew that the teaching of the time was you, you forgive up to three times and then you kind of got a right to hold a grudge. And so he asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Up to seven? So he kind of thought, you know, he was doing pretty well. But Jesus answered him in Matthew 18, 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Forgiveness is a lifestyle. Forgiveness is a daily process. It's why it's in the Lord's prayer. It's the model prayer from Jesus. Forgive us our trespasses, how? As we forgive those who trespass against us. He said to pray without ceasing, and if that's the model prayer, then we are to have a habitual lifestyle of forgiving people. It's like, it's like you got the perfect garden. Something happens. It's an opportunity for a bitter root, but you go, poop. Nope, not with that. And, and somebody offends you, poop. Nope, not going to walk around offended. Somebody hurts you, poop. No, I'm not walking around hurt. Some of y'all need to get the weeds out. And there are, there are countless people I know would be in church this morning if they had learned how to weed their garden. But instead, over and over again, and they act like it's okay. Well, I'm hurt. I am not indifferent to your hurt. I am sorry that you're hurt, genuinely. But that's why Jesus said to forgive. The fact that they hurt you is on them. The fact that you walk in hurt is on you. You're not going to stand before God and say, well, I know I never forgave them. I know I never went back to church, but you know what they did? You see what they did. And God says, well, do you want to talk about all the things you did? <sighs> it's like I read a book of, of Americans' excuses to get out of church, and it's like I sit there and I just pick it all apart. You're welcome. You're welcome. God wants to set you free from that stuff. And what the word forgive means, it means release a debt. Because here's the ultimate thing. He says, if you won't release, my father won't release you. And it's amazing. Like, we think by not forgiving them, we're putting them in jail. But in fact, God is saying, no, when you hold on to bitterness, the only person you're putting behind is you. When you release them, you know who you're letting out of jail? You. It's like you've jailed yourself and you're in there holding the key. And you release them and you come out. Well, they don't deserve it, do you? 
to you. Oh, we could get up here and talk about revival and jump up and down and give all these things, but I tell you what, there's no revival if the church doesn't forgive. See, I ain't preaching for hype. I'm preaching for the real thing. And the real thing comes through, listen, sharing the word of God boldly and going after Jesus with all your heart. I'm not preaching stuff to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not accusing anybody. What I'm saying is we need to get under the microscope of the Holy Ghost and let him come in and set us free from this bondage and this stuff. Because ultimately to forgive means to release the debt. So to listen, to be healed from your inner hurt, you've got to recognize the hurt. But second of all, number two, you have to release your hurt. You've got to let it go, give it to God. First Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You're not, this is for somebody, and I, I didn't even realize what I was saying when I was thinking this. You're not protecting your family by worrying about them. There are people who, I mean, if worrying paid, they would be millionaires. You've you've made a profession out of thinking negative things and thinking they're going to happen. And then you worry about them because you think somehow by worrying, you'll keep them safe. I don't know who this is for. But I just heard the Lord say, your family doesn't need you stressed. Your family needs you healthy. (laughs) Don't make worrying a career. If you feel like worrying, pray. And when you pray and you give it to God, leave it with God. Man, there's a few of you clap to that. I'll take it. All of this comes down to this. Is God God? Is he a God of justice? Because if he is, then he, if God is a God of justice, if he is the all-time sheriff, then he doesn't need me to do it for him. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath. In other words, it means give God the opportunity to do what he does. For it is written, this is God, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God is saying, I alone have the right to enact vengeance. He alone, and God, listen, he's way better at it than we are. I mean, you've heard the phrase poetic justice. And think about this. Daniel had served multiple kings and done it with excellence. And he's made it to King Darius, the last king he would serve. And he did such a good job, the king was going to make him the the highest official in the land, the prime minister. But the other servants were jealous, and they conspired. And they ended up getting him thrown into a lion's den. And then at that moment, I think anybody could have said, God, I have served you my whole life. How is it that my life ends by getting eaten by lions because these sinners lied about me? But you know, Daniel kept his faith. He knew that God was going to protect him. And when he was drawn out the next day from the lion's den because the angel of the Lord had shut their mouths, Do you remember what happened? Do you know what happened to his accusers? It's like God just like, I think, whispered into the king's ear. You remember those guys that lied about Daniel? That looks like a pretty good spot for him, right? He probably didn't even know God was talking to him. He says, well, that's a pretty good thought I just had. And into the pit they go. God knows how to take care of stuff. Come on. (laughs) Man. And we got to remember this too as Christians. 
We need to want them saved. I mean, you got to think about Jonah. Didn't want to preach to the Ninevites. They were, they were Israel's number one enemy. And the thing that upset him the most was when they repented and got right with God. Do you know sometimes God's way of vengeance is this. He just saves them. It's like they hurt you and they do all this stuff and then later on. And I've had even people do this to me like, yeah, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. <laughs> they make things right so often. God, listen, God knows how to work this stuff out. He hasn't fallen off his throne. He hasn't, his eyes haven't grown dim. His hand hasn't grown short. And so the Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and he saves such as have a contrite spirit. The word contrite means, means to be uh, lowered or to humble yourselves, to even be crushed on the inside. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's the truth. Righteous people will suffer in this world, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards all his bones and not one of them is broken. And so we, we want to figure things out. We want to understand everything. Because you read God's promises, and it's kind of like the picture of a beautiful sunset over the ocean. You know, it's just this perfect picture. You see how it ends. You see heaven. You see God working everything out. But we're not in that picture yet. We just got like that one little piece. And you don't understand, and I don't understand sometimes how what somebody did what somebody said, how people are acting, how on earth is this piece fitting into that picture? But God works all things together for good. He's bringing it all together. See, David all along, he, he, could, he could have lost his faith. He could have walked back on God. He could have done all these different things, but instead he just kept praying. He kept feeding his faith. He kept going after God. See, this word, if you'll go after God, it's like medicine. The Bible says, my son, attend unto my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them where in the midst of your heart. Because they're life. To anybody finds them, and it's health to their flesh. He says in Exodus that he sent his word and he healed them and he delivered them from all destruction. There's something about somebody that recognizes their hurt, but they release it to God and they know that God is going to return instead their victory. And the third thing God showed me this week is that in order to listen, be free from the hurt that's in your life is to receive your healing from God. He is the place where you can be made better. There is no pill any psychiatrist gives that can do anything more than bury the issue. That's all they can do. And I'm not speaking against that. I'm saying they can't fix your problem. In a lot of ways, it just makes the closet where you bury the problem just keep getting bigger. Because now you're numb to the hurt. You can't recognize it. You can't release it. And you can't receive your healing. But God sends his word deep down inside and he pulls up that hurt. He pulls up that pain. He pulls up that memory and he releases freedom. First Peter 2.22 says, speaking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross. Why did he do that? That we having died to sins might live for righteousness. That the old us is buried with Jesus. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been raised with him. That we might live a new victorious life. And he says something, and it's interesting, it's in the past tense. He says, by whose stripes, that's speaking of the, of the whip, the cat of nine tails that went across Jesus' back over and over again. By his scourging, you wore 
back then healed. That's why he said as in Isaiah 53, 5, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace that said inner healing was upon him by whose stripes we are. He was looking forward to it. But Peter, looking back at the cross, says, by whose stripes you were healed. You don't have to beg God to heal you. He already did it. You just come in faith and receive what was already done at the cross. Come on. <sighs> Jesus has overcome the world. <laughs> Joseph, just like David, had opportunity after opportunity to get a bitter root inside of him. Instead, he just kept on serving faithfully. After years and years after his beloved father dies, his brothers come and lie to him. They try to manipulate him into forgiving them. And he, he's like, am I in the place of God? Why did he say that? Because vengeance is the Lord's. He will repay. He said, you, everything you did to me, you meant it for evil. I know it. It's like you're saying, you guys, you guys are, you're just as dirty as I know you are. I already, and you're proving it now. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. To save many souls as it is this day. He said, I, I'm not fixated on that one piece of the puzzle. I've seen the box. And I've lived my life, and I'm not tied to that hurt that you did to me. I let it go, and I see now how God was piecing together so many other pieces, and he was making a beautiful mural. He was making a beautiful picture. He says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And you don't understand how this fits, but it does. And I'm going to work it all together for good. He's the God of the turnaround. He's the God of the turnaround. Man, over the last few years, we've watched the way people have acted. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It's alarming. And then on top of that, almost everybody here has lost friends and loved ones. There are people we love and care about they're not physically in the service today if they were a believer they're waiting on us see your puzzle isn't over yet right this piece that hurts doesn't negate what you saw on the box there's a place where he wipes away every tear from our eyes, where there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain. And the Bible says, for the former things have passed away. And so he says in the book of Psalms, chapter 30, verse 11, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've turned it all around. You've put off my sackcloth. That's, that's what, you, what they would wear when they were, they were mourning. Sometimes it was over a loss, a loved one. Sometimes it was over sin. But you've put off my sackcloth. It was really coarse goat's hair, very uncomfortable. And you've clothed me with what? Gladness. See, the enemy wants to tell you, you're going you're gonna to mourn the rest of your life. And it becomes a spirit of grief. And God says, I want to get that off of you. There is no good grief. He's coming to minister this morning to turn these things around. And I know that for some of you, it may not even feel possible, but it, with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. What happened to you, what they did to you, that's, that shouldn't be on you. That's on them. And let God handle it. God, God be your turnaround. Let them watch you go on and live in victory and freedom. Jesus opened up his ministry reading out of Isaiah 61. It's all about the presence and the anointing. Someone could ask, like, what does the church need the most? 
Above all, we have to have the presence of God. <laughs> Moses says to God in the book of Numbers, he says, God, if you don't go before us, we're not going anywhere. He said, how else will the nations know that we're different except for your presence be with us? What separates the church from every religion, every organization? Without the presence, we're just another one. And so above all, we seek the presence of God. And the word presence literally means his face. It's about intimacy with God. And the church can offer something, not a God you can know about, but a God you can know personally. It's, it's, it's vital that we have the presence. And so Jesus, what he says when he opens up his ministry, he walks into his hometown church. And he reads out of the book of Isaiah, and it was just his custom. He was the Bible reader. And he opens up the scroll to Isaiah 61, and it all begins with the anointing. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. The spirit and the power and the anointing of God is upon me. He's anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to the poor. And the very next thing he says that flows out of that preaching is this, and to heal the brokenhearted. He says, I'm going to heal you from the inside out. I'm going to take your baggage and I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to take your hurts and I'm going to bear by those stripes. I'm going to take away your wounds and the things that the enemy is going to, has tried to bring upon you. And as he goes on down, you get to verse 3, which Jesus didn't read that day, but this is the overflow of the anointing. Isaiah 61, verse 3. This is the result of the anointing of God. He says, to console those who mourn in Zion. And he says three things he's going to give us in exchange. Remember, he's a God of the turnaround. He says, I'm going to give them beauty for ashes. Beauty instead of ashes. Ashes were what they would throw on their faces when they were broken, when they were mourning, when they were in distress. But he says, I'm going to give you beauty for the broken places. Come on. Because my presence is on you. He says also in the book of Isaiah that the anointing destroys the yoke. That thing that is heavy on your life, the anointing literally destroys it off of you. It's the presence, it's the presence that we need. It's the oil of joy, he goes on to say, the second thing, for mourning. You were in mourning, but for some reason, God has turned it around inside of your heart. And you have this joy that only God can give. And I'm even though the Bible says in Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is why we praise him. This is why we worship him in the good times and the bad, when we feel like it, when we don't. He's worthy every day. He's worthy all the time. His name is Jesus. He's overcoming for us. I don't care what they did to me. I don't care what they said about me. I know that my God is worthy. Let's not let what somebody did or said steal God's praise. <sighs> He's the God of the turnaround. He says the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I mean, you know, heaviness, that weighty thing, it's the spirit and it's not the Holy Spirit. See, I see this in churches. They believe that like really weighty worship, and by that I mean like this worship that you just kind of feel, ugh. They think that's the Lord. No, 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 no. If you want to enter the presence, you're in, come on, you come into his courts with thanksgiving, his gates with praise. You come in with celebration because he's worthy. I'm not mourning my way into the throne room. I'm going to praise him into the throne room. That's praise and worship. That's revival. That's where breakthrough happens. It's why the devil wants the church nowadays to be heavy and overly bent under the weight of this super serious spirit. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, quit being so serious. That is not the Holy Spirit on you. There is a time to be serious, but some of y'all, seriously, you need to go to the repair shop and get your smiler fixed. He says the planting of the Lord. That means God took your life like a tree and he planted it in his presence that he may be glorified. It's like everybody knows everything that happened to you. It tore down this person and that person, but you're stronger. You're better instead of bitter. You've got the victory. (laughs) The anointing breaks the yoke. There's all this talk about identity, identity, identity. Your pain is not your identity. That's not who you are. You're created in the image and likeness of your God. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You may come out of generations of bitterness. It's not yours. There was this chain of bitterness, but then the anointing came, and it broke the yoke. I want to read one more scripture, I think, and then we're just getting started. I really feel like I'm just like setting the table and then to get out of the way. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right, God, here, and, and just let him do what he does. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, this is what Jesus says for us. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden. Remember we said put on the garment of praise for the spirit of what? Heaviness. To be heavy laden means you're weighed down, carrying a load that God never intended you to carry. He says, and I'll give you rest. How do we get that rest? He says, take my yoke upon you, and then you'll learn from me. What does he mean? See, a yoke was something you would place over the oxen's shoulders so that they could pull the load. And the interesting thing is, if there was a very young ox, it wasn't trained, it wasn't strong yet, they would find a strong ox. And they'd yoke them up. And it's kind of like the little ox thinks, wow, I'm pretty good at this. (laughs) Look at me, I got the victory. That's the way it is when you're yoked with Jesus. God has en- he's enabled you to walk in a strength that you don't have on your own. A wisdom and a freedom that only he can give. And so that's why he says, and learn from me. Let me teach you how to do life. See, we've all been taught by the world how to do life. How many of y'all know since the day you were born, this world's been trying to program your computer? And, it's, and, and listen, the world system is driven by the enemy, And so your mind got programmed wrong, most likely. And that's why he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. (laughs) Jesus says, I want you to take that mess, that, that addiction, that hurt, that heartache, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that thing somebody did to you, that thing that happened to you, and I want you to just get up under my yoke, and I'm going to pick it up off of you, and then I'm going to teach you how to live in freedom. I'm going to give you the oil of joy for the spirit of mourning. I'm going to give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. I'm going to turn your mourning into dancing. He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. The word lowly means he literally humbles himself and comes down. 
No greater act of humility than this. God Almighty became flesh. Remember, he's near the brokenhearted and such as have a contrite spirit. You know what? He sees somebody walking with their chest out and they're all full of pride and arrogance. You know what he says? I can't do anything with that. Right? Like we're oppressed by, you know, all these people that they just seem to have it all together. But God, I think, oftentimes is the least impressed and the most concerned about them because he can't help them. But if they'll humble themselves, <laughs> he's near the brokenhearted. He says, I'm gentle, I'm lowly, I'll give you rest. You'll find rest for your what? Your souls. Our souls are what needs rest. Our souls need rest. You need rest when you go to bed at night, right? You need peace of mind. Listen, you may have the nicest car, the nicest house. You may have 15 versions of the American dream. But if you don't have the peace of God, you don't have anything. You are broke without him. And you have a sin debt that only he can pay. He says, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. My burden is light. This is a game changer. This changes everything. Some of you, your life is like, it's, you don't even have any current events anymore. It's like, what happened? You know what I mean? It's like your life was made by the History Channel. I don't, want you, I don't want you to live that way anymore because it's destroying what God wants to do in you. And it is the number one enemy of revival. It's why I got kind of like a bullseye on it this morning. It's like, how about a bitterless church? How about a hurtless church? doesn't mean we don't ever get hurt, never been hurt. It's just we're not walking in it. I want a church of current events. What I mean is this, we're not talking about the hurts in the past. We're not locked up in what happened back then, but rather what God is doing now. Come on. Did you see that person get saved? Did you hear about so-and-so that got delivered and set free? Did you hear about that person who got healed last Sunday? Did you hear about how God healed somebody in the streets this week? Did you hear how God's moving in Buchanan, how he's moving in our region? Let's have a church of current events. He is not the great I was. He is the great I am. We have all lost things and been hurt. And if there's anybody that doesn't make light of that, it's God. He is the one that went on the mission to heal us of hurt. In the book of Ruth, it opens up with a family that moves out of the will of God. They move to a, a place of a foreign nation where they worship other gods, Moab and the woman's name is Naomi, and her name means pleasant. She, she was fun to be around. She was a joyous, life-filled person. But while she's there, her husband dies, and then both her sons die. And she just she lost everything. And someone speaks her name, and, and she says, you know what? Don't call me Naomi anymore. Don't call me pleasant and joyful Call me Mara, which is the Hebrew word for bitter. And every one of us has an opportunity in our life to switch over from pleasant to bitter. We've all been given that opportunity. Some of you more than me, some of you maybe less. I don't know, but God knows. 
but she, she chooses the wrong result, but God's grace. Because she tells her daughter-in-laws, you know, I can't have any more sons for you. You might as well abandon me too. And of course the one does because it makes sense. Mara can't do anything for them. But one of them says, no, I'm going to stay with you. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you stay, I'm going to stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And where you die, I die. And people watched this, this lady named Ruth walking around with Mara. And they said, you know what? That Ruth is better for her than, than a dozen sons. See, whatever you have in Jesus is more than enough. What, you preaching contentment to the modern church that says more, more, more? Yes, I am. Because the Bible says godliness with contentment is the means of much gain. If I'm happy where I am, at some point he can trust me with more. Oh, I think I'll say that again. If I'm happy where I am, he can trust me with more. And so they, they go back home, and she's got nothing. They have to go out during harvest season and kind of walk behind the harvesters and just get the leftovers. They're beggars. They're, they're beggars. And they just happen, listen, Ruth just happens to end up in the field of a rich man named Boaz. And in the Bible, there was a, what's called a kinsman redeemer. He was a relative that if you got in debt and lost your stuff, he could buy it all back for you. He's a picture of Jesus. When we owed a debt we couldn't pay, Jesus paid the debt he did not owe. And it just so happens that this Ruth catches the eye of old Boaz. He says, who's that? And when Naomi finds out about it, or should I say at this point still Mara, she says, that's our kinsman redeemer. Go let him know. See, her faith is starting to ruminate. There's a chance. There's a chance. God's grace is still here. There's a, don't fall short of his grace. It's limitless. And so she goes and she, she lets Boaz know. And before the day is out, he's made the transaction. And Ruth is his. What does that mean? Everything that Mara had lost has now been restored to her family. And not only that, it's not very long before there's a little baby Boaz. His name is Obed. And it's interesting, all the women began to, they began to chatter about how good God had been to Naomi. It was, it was the gossip and the buzz of Bethlehem. Have you seen how good God's been to Naomi? Isn't this amazing? Isn't our God awesome? Look what God's, he's more blessed. She's more blessed than any of us. Look at this. And now, and they said, God has given Naomi a son. They didn't say God's given Ruth a son. God's given Naomi a son. And she nurse, he nurses at her side. Come on, church. God knows how to restore the broken places. He knows how to piece it all back together. I want to bring worship back forward at this time. Your story isn't over. The God who created the universe has already made a plan for you. And he, listen, the Bible says that his mind cannot be changed. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's not changed his mind about you, that our God is on the throne, and that he is more than capable of turning this saint around. Don't walk through life being a Mara. Get your joy back. Get your freedom back. Get your bounce back. Get your, ooh, get your smile back, thankfully. Let him turn your mourning into dancing. Let him take off that garment of mourning and give you a garment of praise. Put on a garment of praise. Hallelujah for the spirit of heaviness, the oil of joy for mourning. Let him give you beauty for ashes. This morning,
I said about recognizing the hurt. It's getting real with God. I want to be real with you all. There's a reason maybe we don't talk about this much. And that's because it's not easy. I don't know, and please don't take this wrong, but I'm being real. I highly doubt you're going to get the biggest TV ministry in America by addressing real things like this. I don't necessarily, I highly doubt it's like the path to popularity. But if it's the path to freedom, if it's the path of love, if it's the path that I actually care about you enough to talk about the one who cares for you infinitely, then this morning is really, really important that we don't walk out of here with our stuff. Can I say this? If the church is going to have a clean body, it's got to have a dirty altar. Like this has to get really messy. Because we show up with our hurts, our worries, our hang-ups, our unforgiveness, goodness gracious, our bitterness. We don't bring it here just to talk to God for a minute about it. We release it. Take your junk to God and let him clean house. But don't, by any means, walk out here and take it back to your house.